Great. So welcome to this evening's event. Um, we have got a great lineup of speakers for you. So as I said, my name's Claire. Um, really, the reason this came about was I um, ran an e-waste amnesty week in our city for the first time this January. I was contacted from, with, from people across the country saying, how do I run this? So off the back of it, I kind of created a toolkit and said, and how about we get together one evening and I'll explain a bit more about it. And then I thought, wouldn't it be much more interesting if I invited lots of other people who are involved in this kind of thing to um, come along and talk about their things as well. So that's how this evening has come about. Um, the, I'm sure there'll be lots of questions as you go. Feel free to use the chat to ask questions. We will have time for Q&As at the end, but as we're going, it's always really helpful if people kind of pop questions in so that they remember what they are. And we will try and do a bit of briefing as well so that we can get through as many of those um, by the end of the evening. So feel free to use the chat for that. Um, and I will be emailing everyone a link at the end of this as well, which will give you a link to like all the presentations and various links that we've mentioned throughout the evening as well. So um, don't worry about, you know, you to take copious notes, uh, but the presentations will be available uh, possibly even later tonight if I'm super organized, but we'll see. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first speaker, and that is Fiona Deer from the Restart Project. And um, I'm hoping Fiona, Fiona has a wealth of knowledge of the challenges of e-waste. And I've asked her really this evening to come and just set the scene a bit and say, why are we even thinking about um, electrical stuff? So Fiona, if I can hand over to you. Great. I'll just share my screen, which will hopefully go seamlessly. Um, almost seamlessly, now I just need to present it. <laughs> Great. So, um, yes, so I'm going to talk about why, why it's worth um, avoiding e-waste, um, which I'm sure most of you know anyway, but I will just tell you a few headline facts. So um, e-waste or electrical waste um, is the fastest growing waste stream in the world. Um, globally, it, um, the, the amount of e-waste that we produce each year weighs more than the, the Great Wall of China, which I find mind blowing. Um, but also the UK is particularly bad at it. So if you look at um, the red box here, that's us. We are the, um, the third highest producer of e-waste e per like in total um, out of the European countries. But um, if you just look at how, how close we are to the amount that Russia produces, it's, it's, quite, um, it's quite stark. And then we are the second highest producer of e-waste in the world. Per, and that's if you look at it per person. So we're, we're not doing very well as a country in terms of production of e-waste. Um, but, so it's, but it's not just the kind of waste end, which is kind of the most visible problem about kind of the churn of, of electronics. It's also kind of what goes into them. Um, and there's all sorts of things that go into them. And, and many of us know about the conflict minerals, rare earth minerals that are now, you know, they're looking at mining the deep, the bottom of the ocean to get these minerals that are in our phones that we're throwing away. Um, but just to give you a sense of kind of carbon, um, carbon emissions that go into it. Um, we did a study a few years ago and looked at the entire life cycle of electricals um, and um, how much of how much of the carbon emissions go into each phase. Um, and with most electricals, more than 50% of the carbon emissions produced in the entire life cycle are before they've even got into your hands. And so if you look at a laptop, that's higher. That's about 80% of the carbon emissions um, are, be are before you you've opened the box and the rest is from use. So um, uh, there's just this really, really nice little graph where if you look at... Um, if you were to replace your laptop every four years, you're looking at the pink line here and you can see how much that makes a difference to, to the carbon impact of you, of you using your, your laptop. If you can extend it a bit and, um, and keep your laptop for six years, then you can see the drop. If you can keep it for eight years, if you can keep it for 16 years, then that's a massive, massive drop. So, so it's just, um, so we really need to be, uh, keep, keeping keeping using these things in the form that they come in um and the reason i said it in that kind of weird way is that kind of we we all we're hearing about recycling all the time that's the thing that we most use and even <laughs> any anyone who's kind of um talked to the public about climate change you quite often get oh but it's but i recycle <laughs> and um and uh the thing is recycling is like almost the only thing that is resourced um um 
and it's the only the only thing that we really have a policy for at a national level um but it's really inefficient it's a really um it's it's a really ineffective way of keeping the resources from our uh, from our products and they sh it should really be a last resort just above um landfill and um and incineration so what we need to be doing is is keeping things intact as much as possible so repairing as much as possible to to keep things that we still have um sharing so avoiding uh, avoiding buying things in the first place because you and and especially you know we all hear about drills for example that only ever get used for eight minutes in their life life um time and then reusing things so passing things on um when once we're done with them so other people can use them and all of that what it does is it stops us buying new things so that obviously saves carbon emissions and um resources by reducing demand it obviously reduces the this growing e-waste mountain but there's also a lot more jobs in in repair than recycling and landfill um and um and the jobs are spread out around the country so they're they're, they're a really great way of kind of of um uh, what the government would say is leveling up um they're great for helping people through the cost, cost of living crisis and and they build communities so anyone who's which is probably most of you who have been involved in a repair cafe will know um so i'm gonna i'm um so i was about to stop there <laughs> um but we're gonna i'm gonna talk about our what we're calling for so um we we know that at the moment it's too hard to repair and reuse um and it's much easier to buy new so we need national government policy to make it to kind of level the playing field so we've um with a lot of other partners in the sector we've launched a repair and reuse declaration um and the link to that is down the down the bottom i won't go through the policies but the idea is to kind of uh, generally make repair repair and reuse easier um so we've got um over 300 groups signed up to it now loads of repair, repair cafes lots of national groups and businesses and a growing number of mps so we're up to 30 now we're, we're keen to to push that up so if you can sign up as a group that's brilliant if you can encourage your mp to sign up and encourage your mp to come and see what you're doing that's that's even better and um and, and then we can kind of show the new government and carry on keeping up the pressure um so that they they uh give more more support to repair and reuse so that's me i'll stop sharing now Lovely. Thank you, Fiona. And that just sets a bit of a context of, you know, why it's really important that we uh, are, you know, repairing, but also reusing and rehoming things. And that's kind of what the, the next little section is about, is some of us who have been involved in uh, rehoming electrical items. Um, so we're going to have three of us talk through different um, projects that we've run, and we hope that they will inspire you and very much kind of take some learnings from it and adapt things for your own community and, and your own setting. Um, so I'm just going to do the next bit and uh, let me just share my screen. So as I mentioned, um, last year we got some funding from Hubbub and O2 Virgin Media, Virgin Media O2, I can never get it in the right order, um, to run a project in our city where we were really looking at um, finding out the sort of stats that there are around the place about the amount of tech that people have lying around their homes. Was that true for Portsmouth residents? But also, more importantly, kind of what were the barriers within our city to um, doing stuff with the, the e-waste that are sitting in their homes? Um, also, who was most likely in their household to do something about it, to help us kind of with the comms of things? Um, and off the back of it, we as Part of the result of it, we ended up running an e-waste amnesty week, um, which you can find the toolkit on our website. Now, um, I'm not going to talk through the whole of the toolkit. I'm just going to give you um, a little snippet of stuff. But the first thing we did with our research was we went to lots of community events. And two things that really struck us from the people that we spoke to was that 50% said the reason that they actually didn't do anything with it was they just never had the time. They never found the time. They wanted to do the right thing with it, and they weren't sure what the right thing was. Um, and so things just ended up, you know, in drawers, under beds, back of wardrobes, in sheds, garages, that kind of thing, uh, lofts, and just kept adding to. And the other thing that was we were pleasantly surprised by was that lots of lots of people, you know, like Fiona says, knew about recycling, but actually said they would much prefer when they had stuff that they knew was still working was to actually um, share that with people and, and make sure it benefited other people. And so that was one of the reasons that they didn't just send it to be recycled, was they wanted something uh, more done with it and sort of carry the life on it, of it. 
So when we were looking about uh, the research and deciding therefore what to do, um, one of the things was we decided to come up with an e-waste amnesty um, week, which had never been run in the city before. And in our city, it's a bit different than some. So you can actually put electrical items on top of your recycling bin if they are a certain size, but a carry bag and be taken away to be recycled. As I say, lots of people say they wanted to do more. So we wanted very much to um, sort of change ongoing behavior. What we didn't want was to just create a one-off event that then we would end up with, you know, people going, and now what? Um, so we designed it very much where we looked across our city and found where would already accept those items that were still reusable and resellable. So we partnered with a group of charities across the city and we basically pro promoted them as there's somewhere in your neighborhood that you can take electrical items that have still got life that's left in them and we sort of had a little catchphrase of donate with purpose. I think it's really important when you're designing these kind of things to think about who is it that you're targeting. Now, in our case, we just went gung-ho and went, yeah, we're just going to target everyone. <laughs> in hindsight, maybe I would have, you know, you might want to do that differently. You might think we're just going to look at certain groups. Um, but it was, it was an adventure going for the whole city. And because we had a bit of funding, we could do more advertising than we would have done if we had done it in a different way. Um, the other thing to think about is obviously when. So for us, people were saying, you know, if you prompted us, maybe we do something. So we actually ran it in January of this year. And part of the reasoning for that was we figured lots of people got new stuff at Christmas. Um, so before they then stuck away their old stuff, just shoved it in the drawers, like that was a moment to kind of catch them along with the fact that lots of people have, you know, good intentions for the new year and resolutions and that kind of thing. So we, we sort of tried that as a bit of a sweet spot and um, targeted it then. But you could target it around lots of different things. Obviously, we've got things like a great big British Green Week coming up and, uh, you know, maybe September when people are going back to school. But depending on who you're targeting, there's lots of different times of the year that you could do it. Um, the other thing that we really thought about, and I would say this to everyone, whoever that asked us about this, is just think about what resources you've got. So we did not want everyone rocking up at our shop in our shopping centre. We've got a hub there with a repair cap and a lot of things, just giving us their stuff. And we would then become this place where people could just drop stuff off because we just did not have the capacity, we didn't have the space. So that's really why we looked at partnering with others um, to do things. And one other thing I would always suggest if you're going to design something like this is maybe think about what type of item. So we kind of went for almost anything. Um, that led to some challenges when we had different charity shops involved in different processes. So it might be, if we were to do it again, that we might say, you know, we're just going to do kitchen things this time, or this year we're going to focus on mobile phones. So um, it's worth just having a bit of a think about. We've also created a website, which meant that if people had stuff as well that needed recycling or they wanted to sell it, you know, cost of living crisis, people are really up selling stuff. So where locally could they do that? And um, we promoted that lots during the week as well. When it comes to working with others, um, a couple of tips that I would suggest is, you know, obviously finding people that have got similar objectives are going to get benefits from it as well. Um, talking with people about a bit of a backup plan, like what happens if we get a lot more stuff than we're expecting? So we had a bit of a, a plan with certain, you know, like we'll just send in and, and help find some extra space. But it's always worth, you know, planning for the best as well as the worst. Um, the other thing is really understanding the other organisations that you're working with processes so you know different charity shops would accept different things or they'd have different ways of doing things um, and communication if you do work with charity shops it's really key you know every day in a charity shop you've got different volunteers doing different things so really clear and simple partly because we also wanted them to monitor what came in so that we could see how effective um, the campaign was um, but you know so communication as much with the organizations you're working with as with the public and the people that you're um, trying to contact. Um, this was just a quote afterwards, we got some quotes from various people. Um, and actually this particular charity shop, which is quite close to where I live, uh, one of their volunteers is also one of my volunteers at a Repair Cafe. And I was literally chatting to him on Saturday and he said, Claire, it has totally transformed since January how much they get into the shop for selling for electricals. So he said, and people just come in saying, we never knew you accepted this before, and it's great, you're in our neighbourhood. So that was a lovely thing to hear several months on, but, you know, which is what we designed it for. So that was really cool. Just a couple of things um, to consider. There's rules around 
things that are waste. And obviously, we've talked a little bit about e-waste. Um, and if you are actually collecting waste, there's sort of licenses that need to be gathered. But when you're talking about with, you know, donators things for repairing or to sell on, it's not waste. So you can just make sure you're designing things, um, you know, which don't create far more work than you need to create, really, I suppose my tip on that. And you do get lots of questions. We got a lot of questions about data. So people, that was one of the other things that people said they didn't pass on their stuff because they were worried about how to properly get clear their data off. Um, so be ready for those questions. Make sure you know if you're working with others what their processes are. Um, and that's just something to, to really think about. And when you're planning anything, as I said as well, just um, how you want to measure your impact so that you can work out if you're going to do it again, what would you do differently? And very much um, embed that from the start. Uh, so that was a whistle stop tour of our e waste amnesty week. Um, as I say, we've created a toolkit which goes into a bit more depth that's available on our website, and I will include that in a link um, in the email that I will send you after this evening as well. So, as I say, any questions, feel free to put them in the chat and we will come back to them at the end. Um, but I'm now going to hand over to Helen Innes from Hubbub. Um, and they're involved in running the hashtag Rehome Your Electricals uh, project, which is running in Milton Keynes. So, Helen, if I can hand over to you. Hello, thank you. So I had to find the mute there. Um, can everyone see my slides okay? Okay, cool. That's good. Um, so, yeah, I'm I'm Helen. I'm from Hubbub. I'm a creative partner um, for Hubbub. And um, we have, let me, let me just gather myself a second. <laughs> um, so those of you who don't know Hubbub, Hubbub's an environmental organisation that um, promotes people to make good choices for the environment and for everyone. Um, I'm also a project coordinator and volunteer at the old bathhouse and um, community centre in Wolverton. Um, and they are a charity that has hosted a community fridge since 2017. It's a very well established community fridge. Um, and the bathhouse also hosts other projects such as a monthly repair cafe, a community hub. <clears throat> so when Hubbub applied to Material Focus for funding to test whether a community fridge setting could be a good place to uh, drop off and rehome working small electricals, um, fortunately, the bathhouse was one of those places. Um, so what we've done is we've run a three month pilot in Milton Keynes and also in London at Old Brighton Community Fridge. So I'm going to talk to you about a little bit about Milton Keynes because we're a little bit more advanced there. Um, we are two and a half months through a three month pilot. Um, the pilot has um, the pilots kind of coming to a close. We're we're almost at the end of it. Um, we're, what we do in Milton Keynes is we have uh, two community fridge sessions. Uh, we have a community hub session, which is weekly. And we also have a monthly repair cafe session. And those sessions are available for the community to drop off working small electricals. What we do at those at that session is we have a team of volunteers who we've trained to pat test those electricals mm -hmm. and make them available to rehome. So right at the very beginning, I had to look at public liability insurance, first of all, um, so there were two options. There was the bathhouse charity um, cover, public liability cover, which um, is through Zurich. Fortunately for me, there was there was nuances with repair and pat testing. Um, Zurich were able to cover us under the charity public liability insurance because the pat testing that we were doing was not repair. If we were to repair, they wouldn't have been able to cover us uh, because the liability would then lie with uh, the repairer. So thankfully for me, Rehome Your Electricals is only pat testing. Um, the second option was public liability insurance through 
a specialist insurer and I looked at Wessex Insurance. There are brokers and they specialize in repair cafe. I'm sure all of you guys uh, kind of know about this, but their insurance is, there's a different nuance in that. They won't insure us just to pat test and rehome with someone else, but they will insure to repair if the person getting the repair is also taking it it home um so um that was kind of quite a big learning so because we're collaborating with the repair cafe we can invite people to bring things along to have them repaired but they are also then covered under the public liability insurance of the building and bathhouse charity uh, for us to be able to rehome it um the second sort of quite big challenge was was training. So the health and safety executives say that PAT testing should be done by a competent person. And so to comply with that, we felt that there should be some certification. Fortunately for me, um, all of the volunteers that I've recruited to do the PAT testing are all experienced with electrical repairs. So for those guys, we've done online training and they've had online certification for that. But what I'd recommend is if you have less experienced volunteers that are gonna be doing the PAT testing, um, then perhaps like a group training session, which is slightly more expensive, but it is quite dry content, uh, good for volunteers to get together and good for everyone to bond. Um, so, I've written a list of, of good items to have um, and I've got a couple of tips which I'm sure you're all across. It seems obvious now, but it wasn't at the time. Um, having a coordinator that's kind of a jack of all trades has been really key to the success of this project and this pilot. So having someone that could edit the website do a call out on social media, do social media posts, be able to manage volunteers and coordinate a regular weekly PAT testing session, but also be public facing, be able to meet with um, local charities has been really key. Um, I would say PAT test everything first. We get lots of items come in that, are, that require cleaning. Um, there's nothing less motivating than spending 20 minutes descaling something only to find out it doesn't work <laughs> it's a killer um i would also say when we've been collecting items um it's been really important for us uh, sort of a key message for our volunteers that are accepting things to be dropped off is to say you know have you got the remote control is everything with it have you got an adapter you know can we charge it up is it working is it clean and making sure that all of those items are put together in a bag and sellotaped to the telly or, you know, tied to it so they don't get lost because um, you actually will find it very hard to rehome something that you can't power up to test in the first place and it immediately becomes recycling. Um, I think that it's kind of, it's really important that... Um, you've got a really good stock of stuff um, so it doesn't hold things up. Um, what, we've, what we've discovered is there's lots of barriers to receiving these items. Um, they're often dirty, they could be broken. Um, we've found that because we've had such a successful call out of items that uh, storage issues can storage can become an issue because if you're not testing things quick enough and then the charity our charity partners are not picking them up quick enough um then we've got storage issues so there's a really really quick turnaround every week with what we're doing um i love uh reducing admin and so um we've set up some um like shared documents uh we've got like a job form for collecting data for marketing and We've got a shared Google spreadsheet. This has actually become a barrier because for some of our volunteers and charity partners that um, haven't been able to access it, I would advise spending 
time early on to like help charity partners and volunteers to be able to use those tools. Um, so, oh, I've gone, I've, I've gone back a slide. <laughs> Hang on, let me just go back to my, my, let me see if I can do that. There we go. Uh, so yeah, the pro the call out has been really, really successful. And in less than three months, we've gone from three charity partners to six. Um, it was really, really good call for us to partner with local charities because I didn't want to have to qualify need. And I really wanted um, them to go to people that needed them. So by partnering with local charities, we've kind of given them that responsibility and they've really loved it. But one of the things that, ha that has really encouraged, like Claire said earlier, is um, that more donors want to donate if it's going somewhere where it's needed or where it's qualified to need. So having the charity partners has been um, a really positive thing for the pilot. Um, yeah, clear messaging has been also really, really important. I'm so fortunate that Hubbub as a, as a, a design organization has done great banners and posters to be able to promote the project. Um, there's been, um, I'm gonna move on. So, um, the project, so the project's coming to, um, it's coming to, the pilot's coming to its end. And at the bathhouse, we're really, really keen to carry it on. So I've put an annual budget together and I think it's probably gonna cost around 7,000 pounds a year to continue it. Um, with that, that would mean a coordinator working for five hours a week, which would include a little bit of admin and some volunteer coordination. Um, we've got some amazing stories. Um, YMCA have like a donation station. So they take small items and make them available to the residents within YMCA. And there's a resident at MK Bus Shelter. Um, he's lovely. He's studying a nursing degree and he's waiting to be rehomed. And he's having trouble getting to the library to do to do his finish his course. And we've thanks to Arthur going the extra mile and updating the operating system. He can now study at home. So yeah, the project's been really successful. If anyone's interested to um, help with fundraising or wants to duplicate the project or would like to see the model and the impact report at the end of three months, please get in touch. Um, I'd love to talk to you. Um, and I think Claire's gonna share my email at the end. And I'm sorry that was so rushed through. I hope that's okay. <laughs> Okay, it was great. Thank you, Helen. Yeah, and we will have uh, the presentations you said will be available after, and you can have contact email. Um, so, last one on this little section that we've got, last but not least, is Lorna from Share and Care in Bath. Um, Lorna, I'm going to share your slides for you. Um, over to you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay, you can move on, Claire. So share and repair, uh, yeah, next one, sorry. <laughs> and I'm gonna work out how to-, to And so, <laughs> can you see me? Okay. Yeah, okay, so basically share and repairs in Bath and our aim is to change behavior through practical action to make repair, reuse and reduce normal, okay? And we do it through five projects. We've got our sharing shop um, in the high street with over 600 items to borrow. I'm just explaining this because it's all the ways that we're reducing waste. And we have uh, repairs sessions in the shop. We have 10 repair cafes and we have pop-ups at the University of Bath and Bath Spa. We run high to workshops. We go into schools and deliver four lessons. And we also have a rehoming um, small electricals in partnership with um, about 15 or so charities, but mainly used by about eight. And to date, we've rehomed about, I don't know, 450 or something items, but we've been doing that for about three years. And it's a, quite a small scale operation, but um, I, I, I emphasize everything that Helen has just said about the cleaning, getting remote controls and all that sort of stuff. Um, so that's the way that we, uh, we operate our five projects. Uh, yeah. 
Um, next slide. So we have in, in conjunction with the home kit, which is the rehoming of small electricals, we work in partnership with two different organizations. The first one is with Bath and North East Somerset Council, who opened up a reuse center um, in Canesham, just outside Bath. Now they can't sell electricals. Um, we, we've been working closely with, with them all the way through the build up of this new reuse center. Um, so we said that we would come um, and train uh, our own our own volunteers and what happens now is that they visit every fortnight and they pack test around 50 or 60 items and all those items then Oh, Lorna get sold they do it really quickly uh in terms of just to keep their own turnover because at the moment um next slide next slide claire something happened oh yeah so oh, no you've gone too far too quick no you've gone have you missed one no. Um, <laughs> so the challenges are, obviously, we've got to, oh, there we go. Um, oh, I don't know what's going on here. But um, if you can go back, yeah. Okay, so the challenges are the uh, local authority rules and regs, but we've managed to abide by all of those, obviously, because... It's a council that's quite slow. We sell at low prices, but the successes are, A, more items are being kept out of landfill. We get money and we also get items for our, our library things, but we also get a lot of things for home kit. We can basically take whatever we like. So that's, that's great. We just started in, um, you can go to the next slide, Claire. No, okay, we've missed something. Sorry, my fault. Um, basically, the other slides were just showing the guys training and and then the difference between when we first went when they all had to wear the the gear and then now they can go and, and we have somebody. Yeah, so that's how it is now. And they have somebody recording and they tell us all the waste um, that we've saved. And this is the first one when they were training and all geared up. But the most important thing is the bottom left is, is having tea afterwards and sharing and building their own community, which is really important. And we've also got um, an administrator now, and again, another volunteer. And we're trying to choose the volunteers from the repair cafe next to the recycling centre for obvious reasons. Okay, well, with the university. So another of our partnerships is with the University of Bath, who we, we always work closely with anyway, but um, with their waste team and their sustain sustainability teams, they came to us to find an alternative um, when they they collect all the waste at the end of the student year. And I'm sure you know how much that was, is and continues to be. Because, and in particular in Bath, we have a huge number of foreign students who obviously come in they buy everything new and they basically they and they can't sell any electricals with the tests. So again, we trained another team, um, supposedly our students and our local volunteers, but the majority were our local volunteers because the students are not very good at turning up, obviously, out of term time. But we can address that again um, this year. And obviously, this is in September in time for Freshers Week. 
If we go on to the next slide, Claire, thank you. Sorry, so this is uh, Tony, who is our um, sort of uh, community engagement partnership person. I think you can see right in the middle there, I think it, no, it isn't. Um, just some of the items that had to be tested. And so all of that, the, the problem is also for the university is that engaging or storing all this stuff is fine over the summer, but the minute students come back, they have to get rid of it all. Um, obviously all the other stuff goes via um, other charities like British Heart Foundation and so on, but all the electricals was coming in through us. So we then set up a stall ready for Freshers Week and basically it was, it was very time consuming and the selling was very time consuming. And not a lot of students really knew about it being the first time. But this year, we hope we'll go. But what the successes are, the incredible, the absolutely outstanding engagement on social media, where I think it was something like um, 600 people um, sharing and 400 people commenting or something, um, saying what an amazing idea it was. Um, we were also in front of the students to recruit students for the repair cafes that we hold up there at the university for them to be student volunteers and to promote the dates of the next ones and we also got um students interested in our student membership of the library of things next slide i think uh <laughs> yeah say so, thank you for listening <laughs> um i mean this is very difficult to give uh, to uh, in, in the short space of time but um, anyway i hope that was enough to whet your appetites thank you Nona. i think that was really good and i i think it's a brilliant example of just you know how we can also tailor some of these projects to specific groups of people as well certainly with the university it's a great idea um and check out social media to see some of the posts that uh Nona was talking about as well um, so just to finish off um, our speaking this evening, um, I've invited Dr. Anna Scott from Keep Britain Tidy. So I came across um, Anna from one of the Restart Project's podcasts, actually, which um, she recently spoke on. So you have much more time to talk about it then. So I would highly recommend also listening to the Restart podcast uh, that she's delivered. But really interesting research around communicating with the public about uh, waste prevention. So over to you, Anna. Thank you, Claire. I'll just share my uh, slides. Okay. Uh, right, so I'm going to talk about how to talk to the public about uh, the work you're doing, which essentially is, is waste prevention. It's all about... Um, reuse and repair um so just set the scene uh earlier this year we published uh, an, a brand new piece of research uh and it's called a guide to improving public understanding of waste prevention and in this piece of work um this piece of work kind of stemmed from the fact that through uh, through previous work that we've recognized that that most people most people in the general public are not extensively engaged in waste prevention. And they think that recycling is the best thing that they can do uh, to reduce the environmental impact of what they buy. Um, so we recognize that if we want to encourage the uptake of these uh, reduce and reuse and repair rehaul behaviors, then we need better insight led communications and that's what we were trying to do in this in this piece of work and and in the and in this guide. So thinking about you know what's the context that you're operating in when you're when you're trying to communicate with the, the general public. So interestingly, as uh, over seventy percent of people think there should be more information about um, the changes that they can do to reduce their environmental impact on the environment. So in short. People want to hear about how they can reduce, reduce waste. So we don't have to shy away from that point. Um, 
And interestingly, that figure is even higher among people who say that they regularly buy things they want but don't need. Um, so, you know, let's, let's be confident in our communications. People do want to hear these messages. They are open to them. Um, we recognise that there's a, a clear need for consistent and repeated messaging on this topic from multiple varied sources. So almost a quarter of people say that if they're not hearing these types of messages from lots of different places, it can't be that important. So we need lots of people talking about these things um, to show people that it is important. Uh, and we also need to keep in mind the different audiences uh, that we're speaking to and where they're at in terms of their waste prevention journey and how we can tailor our messaging. So around a third of people often buy things that they don't want but don't really need. And the same proportion say that they don't like buying secondhand. So we have to think carefully about, you know, what who are we targeting our messages at and and how should we how should we do that and where are those people at? Um, through our work, we have developed some guidance about specific words that might come up when you're when you're talking about your projects, about, about what you're doing. Um, so firstly, the word recycling. Now, most people use this term to describe most things that we would recognize as waste prevention. So things that are reduced or reuse or rehoming or repair, lots of people will refer to it as recycling. Um, so we just have to be really mindful of that. And I think particularly for local authorities, when they're talking about their recycling services or bins, they should be explicit about that. Um, use of the word landfill. So this word is highly evocative. It's visual. It's negatively loaded. And it's, a, and it's something that people desperately want to avoid contributing to. So... That negative word, it, which, which slightly contradicts with what I'll come on to say, that negative word is useful for encourage, you know, for, for um, the behaviours you're trying to discourage. However, very little of our waste actually does go to landfill in England, uh, particularly low amount in London, uh, where I live. So it is a difficult one because if you talk about stuff going to landfill, you know, in your locality, it might not really be the case but it is a very powerful word so it's something to think uh, carefully about the use of with the three r's reduce reuse recycle for lots of people these blur into one um, and they don't see how they're distinct from each other so three in ten people think that they all mean the same thing and i think four in ten people only four in ten people ordered reduce reuse recycle in the correct manner so lots of people getting it wrong and a significant proportion of people thinking that re recycle is, is at the top. Um, so we think that these words are, are, are too general and that we need to be more specific with the words that we use. And I'll come on to that shortly. Um, with the use of waste, so, you know, I've been talking about waste prevention, but in its very holistic sense, um, waste to most people means what you throw away in the bin. So if it ends up in a bin, it's waste. And if it if it didn't, it wasn't really waste. So thinking about the term waste prevention, it's um that term waste can be counterproductive. Um also people respond better to positive words. So the words that we really should be focusing on using and you and you oops sorry just skipped on um one. And, you know, you've been using them in your language tonight, which is really good. With these kind of words in the pink here. So talking about donating, rehoming, sharing, repairing, borrowing, mending. These are all really um, positive words that we, we should be making use of. And obviously great that, that lots of you here tonight are already doing that. Just something about framing your message. So people respond badly to being told what they're doing is wrong they're not doing enough of or how they need to change so it's really important that we frame our mess messages positively celebrating and normalizing what people are doing to address their waste and consumption it's also uh, really important to acknowledge progress so people may be going to huge efforts already 
to to recycle and for lots of people they think that's the right thing to do and it, it is the right thing we're not trying to discourage that this is about trying to help people do more so acknowledge where people are on that journey and acknowledge their their progress and you'll see how we've um, framed that message uh, in a moment um, and telling people why is really important so if you want if you want someone to donate their their electricals rehome their electricals tell them tell them why 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 is that important and reminding them that their individual efforts are making uh, a difference so part of the research that we we carried out was looking at uh, you know i've said don't use the word waste but what what's commonly known in the industry as the waste hierarchy which is you know reduce reuse recycle in that order um, we kind of thought, you know, can we produce a version of that 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 explains, that helps people understand the, the behaviours that are better than recycling? And through that process, we recognised that actually that kind of hierarchy needs to be more than just reduce, reuse, recycle. Those term, term, terms are too general. We need to group um, levels in a way that feels logical and relevant to people and the behaviours um, and, and, and the things that people are doing be highly visual using images and symbol symbols and as i said don't we're not referring it to to it as the waste hierarchy so what we produce through our research and core design with members of the public and testing with members of the public is this this graphic here so you can see that we're framing things positively we've got um quite specific words you know we're not being as general as reduce or reuse we've got rehome in there as you can see and um, it's framed positively and we're acknowledging progress so we're saying recycling is good but we can do better uh, and we've clearly got recycling towards the bottom of the hierarchy which is where it sits uh, counter to what lots of people think and um, and when we tested this with the public um, we we got some really good stats about what people thought of it. So 58% of people said that they now realise there are much better ways to reduce their environmental impact than, than using their recycling bin. 73% said they think they could do what it's asking them to do. 51% said it motivates them. 36 said they were going to make changes. Uh, so that's all really positive um, in terms of feedback from the public. So our conclusion here was that this type of imagery, this type of graphic, is a, is, is a useful tool in our toolbox as communicators when we're trying to encourage people to take up these behaviours. Um, but we also tested these sorts of images, so not so much more about the hierarchy, but about kind of separate poster-style images that you can use on their own or as a, as a wider set of um, assets together. And these also um, tested very positively with the public, indicating that they were they were liked and understood, uh, and and people could um, could could realise what what would, what they were being asked to do. So this type of communication is also um, you know a useful tool in the toolbox, um, and all these assets are freely available on our website. They are behind um, data capture, so you need to put your details in. But once you're through, you should get emailed a link and you can email, you can download all of these assets to use um, through your through your own communications, through your 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 own projects. Um, so yeah, so that's my um summary of our of our latest work. And obviously very happy as I'm sure the other panelists are to, to answer any questions that you might have. Brilliant, thank you. Thank you, Anna. Um, I love those graphics. And I was trying to convince, um, I work in a, a shopping centre where we have our unit and on the back of all the women's toilet doors, you've got space for posters. And they've always said to me, oh, do you know what? They just get taken down and we've still got e-waste amnesty ones from January up there. So I'm going to try and sneak in some like buy less because I think that's beautiful in the middle of a shopping centre to have those messages. We'll probably get the rehome space a little bit longer, but yeah, they're brilliant. And um, we've had a few questions in the chat that um, I'm just going to, go through if there's anything else as well feel free to add other bits and Anna while you've just been talking one of the questions was I think early on in that slideshow you had some stats for example like uh you know people's thoughts on buying secondhand that kind of thing um, and one of the questions was have you got any 
stacted age range. So if you look at the, the full report, do you break that down at all to show how different age groups maybe are? Here? Yeah, so, so alongside the report that I showed you, we also did um, a waste prevention tracker survey. Um, and we have talked about those results publicly, but we haven't yet published that report. But that should be coming out in the next few weeks. So there'll be more detailed information about um, the stats that we identified again around people's waste prevention attitudes, uh, knowledge and, and behaviour. Um, and um, once that's out, if you want to have a look and if there's any kind of stats that you, you know, are not in the report, then if you want to contact me, I'll more than happily dig them out. But the aim of that survey was to basically take a nationally representative sample and look at where people are are at with their waste prevention behaviour. And, and as you can imagine, um, you know, people are doing some stuff, but it's not, you know, the conclusion is most people are not extensively engaged in waste prevention. And, and you know, we need them to be quite rapidly. Yeah. That's great, thank you. Um, we also had a question about how we are um, avoiding um, or how we're managing items when they've been designated at wa as waste um, at certain, which I think I, I touched on a little bit about we've generally tried to avoid it. We just started to talk to our local authority. And there's some interesting webinars as well with people like Suez that start talking about um, you know, how to intercept things at various points. I don't know if Helen or Lorne, you've got anything to add? Yeah, yeah we've found it really, really hard because um, we're guided by Material Focus and their recycling um, advice um, to recycle responsibly. We found it really, really hard to find the right channels in Milton Keynes, um, assuming that Milton Keynes Council was going to be the key. Um, thankfully, Milton Keynes Council did use a contractor, yeah, Recycling Lives, that's on Material Focus's list. So we kind of, we're okay. We can recycle through the recycling centres in Milton Keynes. And we carry a waste, we talked about waste certificates earlier. Um, it's really easy to apply for. You just go online. Um, and Milton Keynes Council were really good about basically giving us an exemption uh, certificate so that we can just rock up go to the Weybridge, drop the stuff off, go back to the Weybridge, get a ticket, know how much we've recycled. So that's been really, really helpful for our measurement and evaluation, um, but also having that really nice link. Thank you. Lorna, did you have anything? I actually, I've been. I don't. This. I think there must be a storm in the air because my um my internet just keeps going in and out, so I keep losing you and having to come back. What was the question? <laughs> Um, we we're just saying about how to sort of manage when things are waste rather than. Um, well, we're again, we're quite lucky that we have a very good relationship with the council. So we can just take stuff um, to to the recycling centre. But what we're not very good at is is actually measuring how much we are recycling in that way. And, you know, the. the our project in terms of I, I don't know if you're talking about home kit or just in general but uh, with home kit and the the um because obviously the university has its own and the, the the all this stuff is done at the recycling center so we don't have to dispose of any of that they get they they do all that but for the home kit um we do just put it into our cargo bike and deliver it to the recycling center and I think um, I noticed in the chat as well, um, you know, there's been other projects mentioned like the fixing factory in Camden. I think tonight we were very much focused on sort of where we were rehoming things, I suppose, rather than intercepting waste. So, you know, there are other um, webinars and things available and people are definitely trying to intercept things. So it, I think tonight we sort of talked about the public uh, giving things to be rehomed rather than it having already sort of ended up towards the, the waste facilities and then intercepting them as well um, and in Portsmouth the way that we did that as well was um, as one of our, as our six charities we had a, a local company that their their business is uh, like recycling electrical items for businesses and schools and they basically opened their doors for a week and said residents could bring them piles of stuff as well and they tracked it and they have a quite a good reputation for sort of trying to repair things as well so there's other ways to kind of intercept mm -hmm. it. 
Um, now I'm conscious, it's almost nine o'clock, a couple of other questions that were just there, um, were just about stats as well. I know some, some people are better at it than me. I, I didn't put stats in mind, but certainly, um, you know, all our contact details will be available. So if anyone, certainly if you're going for funding, I know it's always really useful to have other people's stats to say this is what happened somewhere. So feel free to um, you know, take them to your slides or contact you if that's helpful in any way. Um, and I think one final question was just, are there other universities doing what you're doing, Lorna? Have well, I hope there will be now because so many people last year were so excited about it that they might well be contacting their own university. But I think a lot of them certainly do something similar, as in they collect all the all the stuff left behind and distribute it to different charities. But this time they thought, why not try and actually use it for their own students, which you know obviously makes sense. Um and and hopefully that whole concept will will develop across all universities and, and students will get to know again it's all about changing behavior isn't it that when they go they can buy stuff they don't need to go to ikea before they <laughs> etc um but just one re-emphasis of what you were saying about when you start up any of these projects is not always saying yes to everything you know and actually emphasizing have clean products and looking at it when it comes because we do get disgusting things and a lot of time is taken on doing all that sort of stuff so and also knowing where else to send them if you can't if you've got too many that's great all really helpful tips um so i hope um everyone has benefited from uh, the things that have been shared this evening i want to say a massive thank you to all our speakers for giving their time and um it'd be great to hear you know what other people are up to so feel free to um you know add things in the chat and, and contact us if you're looking for more tips and if you guys want to host webinars and tell us about what's going on in different places as well you know get in touch and we will share it on all our platforms as well so thank you so much for joining us as i've said um i will drop an email to everyone later with a link to the website where you've got the presentations for this evening and some useful links so do feel free to you know, use that and to share that with others as well. Um, just want to wish you a great evening. Thank you very much. And thank you very much, Claire, for organising it. You're welcome. Thank Take you. Care, thank, thank you, Claire. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Bye. Bye.